It's Sunday, February 20th, 2011, and you're watching This Week in Linux News. All right, let's start things off with some distro release news. This week, Bodhi Linux version 0.1.6 became officially available. Linux Mint 10's LXDE version now has a release candidate available as well. Mandriva and Magia both had alpha releases of their latest versions this week. If you don't remember, Magia is a fork of the Mandriva project from where a bunch of Mandriva developers got let go, so they created their own distro that forked it. I was actually interested in taking a look at Magia when the alpha came out, but they specifically said in their release notes that it's not ready for reviewers to look at yet, so I'm going to hold off to the next release and see what they say then. In addition, Partis Linux 2 Corporate Edition is now available. This actually uses the KDE 3 desktop, which hasn't been used on most distros in quite a while, and Tiny Core Linux 3.5 and Ubuntu 10.04.2 released as well this week. For more information about any of those distros, feel free to head over to my website, thisweekinlinux.com, and look at the post that's associated with this video. And speaking of releases, we had some software releases and updates this week. Fluxbox version 1.3 officially released this week with a couple of new features, such as bi-directional text. They say they've got new actions, new focus models, new properties, and various and sundry other things. I'm not really a Fluxbox user, so I don't know a whole lot about it. If you're interested, though, feel free to go check it out. I'll have a link in the source code below. In addition this week, OpenShot version 1.3.0 officially released. We've been talking about some of the new features over the last few weeks since the developers have been touting them, but let's just go ahead and go back over them really quickly. With this new release, they've added an updated theme, they've added the ability to put in multiple clips at the same time, they've added some new timeline animations, they've added a bunch of new 3D animations based on Blender, which is required for it. If you don't remember, we mentioned before they were going to be doing snow and lens flares and particle effects and all sorts of other things like that animated world maps. But again, if you're interested in trying it out, definitely go ahead and check out the link down below. Now we had a couple of interesting applications pop up on Android this week. One of them is TeamViewer 6, and if you're not familiar with that, it's a remote desktop application. I know there are other VNC applications out there, but this one is pretty easy to set up on Windows, Mac, or Linux, so it's very nice to have one item that can connect to any sort of, uh, of other OS you want to connect to. In addition, the PlayOn app for Android is now available as well. If you're not familiar with PlayOn, it's a server that you run on your Windows-based machine that will serve out content like Netflix and Hulu and Pandora, a ton of other channels. And basically you can pay for the basic service, which gets you the server and a few of the channels that are available, or you can pay for the premium one, which is a subscription-based service, and I believe it's 40 bucks a year, maybe $40 the first year and $20 every year from then on. I did some very limited tests of it earlier with my Play on Basic account that I've had for a long time. I run it in a virtual machine when and if I need it, which hasn't been very often. The streaming was definitely not as great as I would expect, not as great as I've seen out of some other dedicated devices like my Roku box. But if you're in a pinch, you've got a Windows machine of some sort, and you've got your phone or your tablet, and you want to stream the content, this is definitely one way that you can do it. And speaking of phones and tablets and streaming content to those devices at decent bit rates, NVIDIA announced at Mobile World Congress this week that they're working on a new chip that they're calling Cal-L. That's the, the code name for it. Eventually it will probably be renamed to the Tegra 3. And basically the biggest feature of this Cal-L processor is going to be the ability to play back 1440p content. Yes, that's higher quality than 1080p. It's higher quality than I think any other mobile device is capable of doing right now. It's higher quality than most people's home television sets will do. But the Cal-L or the Tegra 3 or whatever you want to call it is basically going to be a quad-core processor with 12 graphical GeForce processors. All right, let's move on to a little bit of Ubuntu news here. There's not a whole lot this week. Webupdate.org did an article on the newest changes in the Unity interface. Basically, in the most recent changes, the notification area in the upper right-hand corner of the screen where the system tray is, is now available again. However, it's not back for all applications yet. Only Java and Wine applications can use it, as well as the Skype application, as requested by Mark Shuttleworth. But one of the most interesting changes in this latest set of updates is that now the Unity bar actually follows your GTK themes. One of the largest complaints that I've seen to this point is that the bar is static, the bar is unchangeable, you can't theme it in any way. Now you can, and you can make it opaque as well, so you can make it invisible. But since we're talking about Unity, and we've mentioned before that some other distros are planning on packaging it and making it available, apparently the guy that was packaging it for Fedora and the one that was packaging it for OpenSUSE have sort of started to back out of it. 
As I know very well, and I'm sure you guys know, time can really put a lot of constraints on people, and apparently the developers that were packaging and making Unity work with these other two distros just have too many other things on their plate, so they're sort of getting pushed to the back burner. If someone else does want to pick up Unity for Fedora or an OpenSUSE and make it work, I'm sure they're more than willing to allow you to do that. And the last story, a little while back we talked about how Ubuntu is going to be changing their default player from Rhythmbox over to Banshee. Well, up to this point, Banshee has a plugin for Amazon's MP3 store, and 75% of the proceeds made from that go directly to the GNOME Foundation. Well, from what I've read, Canonical has decided that they want that 75% instead, and there's a bit of a conflict going on. The Banshee developers are definitely still committed to giving their money over to the GNOME Foundation, but Canonical saying, if you want it to be the default in Ubuntu, you're going to have to give us money. And the main reason I mentioned this is I wanted to get your opinions on it. Do you think that this is sort of blackmail? Do you think that it's Canonical's right, since they are the biggest distro out there, to say you need to give us money to be included? Does this seem like a slippery slope that if you want to be included in the default, you have to give money to the distro that's doing it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below because I'm really interested to see where this discussion goes. Well that's about all as far as news is concerned this week. If you're interested we've created a folding at home team on the This Week in Linux forum. I'll have a link to where you can find out more information on the forum down in the source code below. But basically folding at home is a program that takes advantage of your unused CPU cycles to help work on developing cures for specific diseases. And so to try to help out we've got a few guys so far that are on a team with us. We're all contributing work cycles and and all that. And if you're interested while you're there at the forum, you can take a look and register and talk to us there. But that's all for today. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time.